in. And so most Shakespeare's plays were usually five acts. And some plays or musicals have two acts. I don't know if you've ever seen the play um, Les Mis, and that has um, two acts. And seeing that on the Broadway production of Les Mis was still one of the most ex uh, amazing experiences of my life. Like any good story, there are usually three parts, or, th or three acts. S the setting the scene or introducing the main characters. And the second act, you have the main characters usually find themselves in some sort of situation that for a time is unresolved. They get something's going on, things that look bad. And then at the third act is usually where the, you have the climax of the story takes place, where the situation is resolved and all the pieces of the puzzle finally come together. And Hollywood loves creating movie franchises, one for the money, but also there's a series of movies that you can form into a trilogy. And I remember one of the first ones that I ever saw was the original Star Wars trilogy. Now think about the first movie, Star Wars, which is now known for all the, the Star Wars geeks as uh, New Hope. Episode 4, which introduces the main characters into the plot line of the story. And while there's some sort of resolution at the end, it's only the beginning part, the first act. The second part of the trilogy, Empire Strikes Back, is where everything kind of goes downhill. The movie ends with really no resolution at all. You're kind of left wondering what's going to happen next to Luke and Leia, especially Han Solo. I don't want to give away the plot. Audiences who first saw the movie had to wait three long years before the return of the Jedi. In today's world of Netflix and everything else, we don't know what that, sometimes we don't know what that feels like because now we can go back and watch these movies and it seems like, but for a while there was three, four years we had to wait for what happens next. The story we've been reading in chapter 10 of, book of, of the book of Acts is in some ways kind of functions like a, a trilogy. Last week, we were introduced to the main characters and the beginning plot line of the story. We learned about two visions from the Lord, one from um, Cornelius, for Cornelius. The other one was for Peter. And we learned that Cornelius was a centurion who was stationed at Caesarea along the western coast of Israel. And Cornelius was a, a God-fearing Gentile who had been exposed to the Jewish faith and the God of Israel. He was a devout man and gives regularly to charity. He is also a prayer warrior, literally. He receives a visit, a, a visit from an angel who tells him that his prayers and acts of charity that he's been given have been, brought a memorial offering before the Lord of God. He is told to send men to Joppa to seek out Peter, who is staying with Simon the Tanner. And while Cornelius' men are on the way, Peter has a dream from the Lord in which he sees heaven opened and an object that resembles this large sheet coming down, being lowered by the four corners of the earth, and it were all the four-footed animals and reptiles of the earth and the birds of the sky. And there's this voice from heaven that commands Peter to rise, to sacrifice, and to eat what is displayed in the vision. This is something that shocks Peter because the food involves a common or unclean food. At first, Peter refuses to obey. He's not going to eat anything that is unclean or common. And so Peter believes by refusing, he is actually obeying God's laws of clean and unclean animals. But the Lord replies that this type of food is now clean. It's not common anymore. And so God wants Peter to know that he has the right to declare food clean if he wishes by merely pronouncing it now clean. It's not what goes into the mouth that defiles a person, but what comes out of the mouth, this defiles a person. And so it takes three repetitions of the vision to convince Peter. And so after the third vision, the sheet over the animals is removed back into heaven. And so that's kind of the first act. You can go back and read in Acts uh, one uh, ch uh, chapter 10, verses 1 through 16. Sometimes I wonder why, uh, that they called this book the book of Acts. They were used to seeing great Greek plays at that time that had different acts. So we're going to be learning about what happens in Act 2 of our trilogy. However, we're going to be left with an abrupt ending, which we'll have to, you're going to be running to your Bibles this week to find out how does this story end. You don't have to wait three years for this one. 
So without further ado, I give you act two of the saga of Cornelius and Peter with the, with the full house of Gentiles. So we're going to be looking at chapter 10, verses 17 through 29. If you have your Bibles, you can turn there now. I'll also have it on the overhead. If you forgot your Bible and you want to read one, it should be in the Pew Bible in front of you on page 976. Verse 17, while Peter was deeply perplexed about what the vision he had seen might mean, right away the men who had been sent by Cornelius, having asked directions to Simon's house, stood at the gate. They called out asking if Simon, who was also named Peter, was lodging there. While Peter was thinking about the vision, the Spirit told him, three men are here looking for you. Get up, go downstairs, and go with them with with no doubts at all, because I have sent them. Then Peter went down to to the men and said, here I am, the one you're looking for. What is the reason you're here? They said, Cornelius, a centurion, an upright and God-fearing man, who has a good reputation with the whole Jewish nation, was divinely directed by a holy angel to call you to his house and to hear a message from you. Peter then invited them in and gave them lodging. The next day, he got up and sent out with them, and some of the brothers from Joppa went with him. The following day, he entered Caesarea. Now Cornelius was expecting them and had called together his relatives and close friends. When Peter entered, Cornelius met him, fell at his feet and worshipped him. But Peter lifted him up and said, Stand up, I myself am also a man. While talking with him, he went in and found a large gathering of people. Peter said to them, You know it's forbidden for a Jewish man to associate with or visit a foreigner, but God has shown me that I must not call any person impure or unclean. That is why I came with you without any objection while I was sent for. So may I ask why you have sent for me? Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for this amazing second act of your trilogy in Acts 10. And we thank you, God, for your many blessings. And I pray, God, that we will understand this passage in a deeper way and that we will be in some ways sucked into this passage and help us to know what you really want us to do in life. And so one of the things that we're going to be talking about today, God, is the fact that that you have brought two people together, two people who hated each other together, two groups of people who hated each other together. And so I pray, God, for all of us in our world who may find, you know, feel like somebody else is the evil empire, the evil person in our life, or the people we don't agree with or disagree with or whatever, God, I pray that you will bring us together and have us have reconciliation because you've called us as the people of God to love you and to love our neighbor. And so we thank you, God, for everything you've given us. We, we thank you, God, for this wonderful gift we have of hearing your word. I pray for your spirit to be upon us now. I pray for the spirit to be with us and help us to apply this passage in a deeper and more penetrating way. I pray the words come out of my mouth this morning will be pleasing to you, be coming from you. We thank you, God, for your many blessings. In your name we pray. Amen. Well, Peter was deeply perplexed about what the vision he had seen might mean, right away the men who had been sent by Cornelius Having asked direction to Simon's house, stood at the gate. They called out asking if Simon, who was also named Peter, was lodging there. And so the Holy Spirit informs Peter about the fact that three men are looking for him. As you cont- we, we continue to read through Acts, you're going to notice time and time again how the Holy Spirit is orchestrating everything. The Holy Spirit tells Peter, get up, go downstairs, and go with Cornelius's men. Don't be anxious or have doubts because I have sent them. The Holy Spirit is vouching for these messengers. The Holy Spirit is orchestrating this whole saga. And so the Holy Spirit is speaking to Peter while he was still thinking about the vision as indicating that Peter is actively seeking out an answer here. He's thinking about it. He's praying about the meaning of what has been revealed to him, about heaven opening and him seeing the sheet of all these animals in it. See, the question is, does Peter need to do a little soul searching? Is there something in his mind and heart that he still needs to be repentant of? Is the Holy Spirit prompting him to change? See, Peter, no doubt, may have been concerned that there was this group of Roman soldiers 
coming for him. He remembers what happened when soldiers came before. This may be one of the reasons why the Holy Spirit reassures Peter, don't worry. The Roman soldiers are not here to take you like they did Jesus. See, it's time for Peter to trust and obey. The word with no doubts at all is also used in a similar way in the word Paul uses in 1 Corinthians verses 10, um, I'm sorry, chapter 10, verses 25 through 27. I put that on your handout if you got one of those. Where he discusses whether or not to buy food in the marketplace that may or may not have been sacrificed to idols. Paul says in 1 Corinthians, eat everything that is sold in the meat market without raising questions for the sake of conscience, since the earth is the Lord's and all that is in it. If any of the unbelievers invite you over and you want to go, eat everything that is set before you without raising questions for the sake of the conscience. You can go back and see Paul's argument in chapters 8 through 10 about what it means, what we should do with food sacrificed to idols. And so the Lord is saying, Peter, do not raise any questions of conscience. Obey my commands without objection. When these people come, go with them. Don't be worried. Don't fret. See, the Holy Spirit wants Peter to go with Cornelius' men. Why? Because the Holy Spirit has sent them. Look at verses 21 and 22. Then Peter went down to the men and said, Here I am, the one you are looking for. What is the reason you are here? They said, Cornelius is centurion, an upright and God-fearing man who has a good reputation with the whole Jewish nation, was divinely directed by a holy angel to call you to his house and to hear a message from you. See, Peter goes down to meet them. He asks why they have come. He's piecing together the reasons and this vision in light of the men's appearance. What's going on? And so the men respond to him and say, Cornelius, this wonderful centurion, God-fearing person, wants you to come and to speak to me to him. See, the men want Peter to know the type of man that who has sent for him and why they are here. The, the Jewish people are speaking well of Cornelius. He has a good reputation with the Jews. The men go on to explain that the angel appeared to Cornelius who sent them to bring Peter back to Caesarea. So this whole thing was divinely directed from the start. Cornelius was very thorough in the instructions he gave his men before they left to find Peter and Joppa. This is what you're going to do. This is where you're going to go. This is what you're going to do. This is what you're going to say. And all that was given to him by the angel. Look at verse 23. Men then invited them in and gave them lodging. See, once Peter goes down and he hears who invited him to come to his house, it begins to make sense why the Holy Spirit said to go with these men without fear or anxiety. You see, if Peter enters the home of a Gentile, it would defile him based on the Jewish law. The Mishnah collection of oral traditions of the law states that the dwelling places of Gentiles are unclean. A Gentile is anyone who's not Jewish. However, New Testament scholar David Peterson points out, when Peter invites the men into the house to be his guests, he is not yet going beyond what the law-abiding Jew might do in entertaining Gentiles. He would be able to keep the Levitical rules in showing hospitality to Gentiles, even though he himself, a guest in the house of another, but he would not have no control over the situation in visiting the house of a Gentile like Cornelius. And so Peter can keep control of what's going on there and still maintain kosher. <clears throat> Excuse me. So Peter invites Cornelius' men in and he gives them lodging for the night before their trip back to Caesarea, of 30 miles back to Caesarea. <clears throat> so the fellowship is central here. Hospitality is important. One of the things we need to understand in this whole discussion of the text that's going behind the scenes here is this battle that's going inside Peter is that some food out there is tied to idol worship. And Gentiles don't keep 
kosher. Now, <clears throat> I don't want to get into this too much. We need to understand the context. If you want to know this more, go back and read 1 Corinthians 8 through 10. But what happens is, is that in this society, you would have Gentiles or, you know, would go to worship idols. And at these different temples, they would sacrifice an animal. And then whatever was left over after the, you know, their meal or whatever they weren't going to eat, um, they would package up and bring back to the marketplace and then sell it. So you basically had people who were selling meat at a marketplace who had just been performed rituals in front of kind of worshiping a deity. And so the Jewish people always had to be careful about where they were buying their food. If it was from one of these places that were buying food from an idol worship temple or whatever, then they would be in, in trouble. And so the question here is, what does Peter now do, who is a believer, has the Holy Spirit, and can he, as a Jew, eat kosher, even though he has the Holy Spirit residing in him, even though he's a, he's a, a Christian now? See, Gentiles would be exposed to these unclean foods because of the various jobs and trades they did. And so Peter then invites them in, though, and he helps them to lodge for the night so that they can go back to Cornelius' house with Peter. So Peter listens to, to the Lord. He doesn't question the Lord. He goes ahead without any hesitation. He prepares to leave with, for Caesarea with Cornelius' men. And so Peter has them stay overnight because he knows that the journey is long and that they need their rest before they go back. It's 30 miles. And so Peter with them the next day is bringing some of his brothers in Christ with him. The text in, in verse 24 says, The following day he entered Caesarea. Now Cornelius was expecting them and had called together his relatives and close friends. And so Peter and the group, they enter into Caesarea, and Cornelius was expecting them and prepared, was preparing for their arrival, and he invites his relatives and his close friends over as well to meet Peter. They are all excited about what Peter has to say. And so four days after Cornelius has this vision, the apostle Peter is now standing before him and his family. See, Cornelius is anticipating hearing this message of great importance. I mean, since he's familiar with the Jewish religion and maybe even some of its teachings, it's possible that maybe he was even looking for the Messiah and may have heard or even known about some of Peter's claims that Peter was making all over Israel about this good news of a man from Nazareth who had died on a cross and risen from the grave. What happens in verse 25? When Peter entered, Cornelius met him, fell at his feet, and worshipped him. But Peter lifted him up and said, Stand up, I myself am also a man. While talking with him, he went in and found a large gathering of people. See, Cornelius greets Peter with this great honor and respect, even falling before him and worshiping him, or at the very least, paying homage to Peter. He knows who Peter is. And so Cornelius is receiving Peter as this heavenly messenger from God to come and bring this message. But Peter refuses these acts of respect. See, he says to Cornelius, stand up, I'm a man, I'm not an angel from heaven. I'm a human being, Cornelius, just like you. I'm not special just because I saw the risen Lord. See, as Peter enters the house, he's greeted by all these people, and this large gathering has come to listen to Peter. And look what happens next. Verse 28. Peter said to them, you know it's forbidden for a Jewish man to associate with or visit a foreigner. But God has shown me that I must not call any person impure or unclean. That is why I came without any objection what I was sent for. So may I ask why you have sent for me? See, Peter explains how unusual the situation is for a Jew. Cornelius and the crowd know the common practice for a Jew is not to associate in any way, shape, or form with a Gentile 
because the law says it's unlawful. And so to associate with Gentiles in this way was taboo. But Peter knows that to enter the house of a Gentile would mean that he may be exposed to unclean practices and unclean foods, which by association would then render him unclean. And he knows the process of where he would have to do in order to be cleansed. See, as John 18, 28 says, visit a Gentile house renders one unclean. But the Lord has shown in this vision to Peter that he should not call people who are Gentiles common or unclean. See, associating with Gentiles is now permitted. Peter said to them, well, you know it's forbidden for a Jewish man to associate with or visit a foreigner, but God has shown me that I must not call any person impure or unclean. That is why I came without any objection when I was sent for. So may I ask why you have sent for me? Peter came because the Lord told him to. That's the reason. And he finally asked Cornelius why they have sent for him. What do you want me to do, Cornelius? Why have you called me here? Next week, we're going to pick up on the story in Acts 3. See, God wants Peter to know that with the death and resurrection of Jesus, new creation has come. A new era has arrived, and this changes everything. It changes how you interact with people you once had to separate yourselves from. See, we're not just talking about what is now clean and unclean when it comes to food. We're talking about who is part of the family of God. God is breaking down the barriers between Jews and Gentiles. The wall has been built up and has now been destroyed, says Ephesians 2. The issue in today's text was not about whether the good news of Jesus was for Gentiles. See, Peter had already preached that several times. He knows that the good news is for anyone who calls on the name of the Lord. The good news is for everybody. Anybody can come to the Lord. But see, the question Peter was wrestling with and needed divine intervention about was the question of Gentile uncleanliness and table fellowship. The question was about who is now part of the family of God. Basically what's going on here is the Lord is asking Peter a very serious question. He's saying to Peter, if Gentiles are part of the family of God because they've trusted in the risen Lord, why, Peter, do you still see them as unclean? See, Everyone who comes to the Lord's table, Jew or Gentile, has a place in the family of God. By calling former unclean foods now clean, the Lord is symbolically removing what has separated Jews from Gentiles. You can think about people and groups of people that we separate ourselves from in our minds. Oh, I can't associate with that person, or I can't eat food with that person, or that person is not like me. It's the same thing that they dealt with in the first century. Sterile Bach writes, the food laws underscore Israel's separation from the Gentiles. By making unclean food clean, God is showing how table fellowship and acceptance of Gentiles are more easily accomplished in the new era. See, they would be separated because of food. Oh, I can't eat that. I'm, I'm, I'm Italian. Oh, I can't eat that. I'm Latino. I can't eat that. That's not part of my culture. When you go into the mission field, one of the things that we were taught when we went to Honduras for two weeks was the guy told us, if someone invites you to their house, you eat their food, regardless of what it looks like, regardless if you're allergic to it, regardless how nasty it looks or unclean it may look, you eat their food part of table fellowship. By eating food with people, you're saying, we are now part of the family of God together. We are together. We are part of the same 
family. There is no Jew or Greek, slave or free, male or female, since we are all one in Christ Jesus, says Paul in Galatians 3.28. The Lord is teaching Peter that those who are seated at the Lord's table are those who are part of the family of God. The picture I have up there is kind of a um, symbolic representation of what it may have looked like in the upper room at the Lord's Supper as they were sitting on the floor on the table. It's not like the you know, the picture of, you know, later on, uh, was it Michelangelo's uh, famous uh, Lord's Supper picture? That's not how they sat. See, the Lord wants Peter to remember that he has been called to love God and to love his neighbor no matter who his neighbor is. It doesn't matter. I gave my life towards Christ towards the end of my freshman year in college, and that summer, I was a new Christian, trying to figure things out, made a lot of mistakes. And I was leaving, I was living at home during the summer, and my mom took me to the church that she had been attending for a while, and she also recently had gotten a new job there. And so I remember walking into the sanctuary and, you know, sitting down as you might in your, a place, you know, maybe it's your first time here, and you're thinking, oh, who are these people, and what does it look like, and where do I sit, and where's the bathroom, and, you know, where's the cafe, all those types of things. You know, you're, you're, you're processing all those things as you walk in. And I remember looking a lot, a lot around and thinking to myself how cool it was to be going to church with my mom as a new Christian. I had never done that before because I gave my life to Christ in college at the end of my freshman year, and I was excited to learn from this pastor there who I heard had a real heart for God and an amazing story and was a wonderful preacher, and as I looked around the sanctuary, I noticed this huge man who looked like a cross between an extra in the 1960s movie Easy Rider, if you've ever seen that movie, and the 1980s WWF wrestler King Kong Bundy. A cross between those two people. I mean, this guy was massive. And he was wearing a crazy tank top t-shirt that he had gotten at the town fair the week before. He had um, some tattoos up and down both his arms that looked pretty scary, things you could see from a distance. And he wasn't smiling, but he looked very, very focused on what I could only imagine. And I started getting a little nervous, and I turned to my mom, and I asked who he was. And my mom turned around and smiled back at him and and waved. And then my mom began to laugh a little bit. I was getting worried, what's going on here? I said, Mom, what's going on? Do you know that guy? My mom smiled at me and said, while still laughing, she said, yes, he's the janitor here. And he is a wonderful, godly man. And she went on to tell me that the Lord had saved him from drugs and alcohol years ago, and he was looking for a job, and so the pastor hired him as the janitor there. And Christ literally saved his life, and later he became the full-time janitor at this church. He was one of the most godly people she had ever met, she told me, and he was on fire for Jesus. He used to, after work, would go around and and evangelize the people in the neighborhood. See, that day I learned a valuable lesson as a new Christian. Never judge a book by its cover. So over the next several weeks, I got to know him more and more. He was this giant teddy bear who knew he was a new creation in Christ, and he knew his identity in Christ. So... I learned that we need to be careful when we put a box around who can be in the family of God and who can't. Because as a new Christian, looking at this man, I think, how is this guy ever going to be part of the family of God? He doesn't look like we do. See, Peter, even with the Holy Spirit indwelling him, imagine this, the Holy Spirit is now indwelling him, he still had things in his life that he needed to be cleaned out. Terry talked about spring cleaning. Well, we need to do a spring cleaning in our hearts. Peter needed a spring cleaning in his heart as well. He still had some prejudice. He had racism. He had sinful thoughts and actions that needed to be dealt with. And see, if Peter needed to purify his heart, 
And he saw the reason Jesus. He walked with him for three years, and he still needed a spring cleaning. If he needs it, then we need to make sure, through the help of the Holy Spirit, that our hearts are purified as well by repenting of any deep-seated prejudice, racism, legalism, or a judging spirit that we may have. See, one day we are going to be with the Lord for all eternity, and we are going to have to be comfortable living with people who we would never associate with this side of heaven. Kind of reminds me of the bus full of new Christians who had just arrived in heaven while everyone was kind of waiting patiently for the arrival of the new heavens and new earth. And so the bus driver was the angel Gabriel, and he began to give a tour of heaven to those on the bus. Oh, now over here we've got, you know, I don't know if you've been on a tour bus guy where the guy is kind of talking as he's driving. He says, now over here we've got the Roman Catholics, and to the left are the Methodists, and to the right we've got the Presbyterians, and over here there are the, and before Gabriel could point out the Anglicans across the street, someone from the back of the bus screams out, ah, who are those people sitting, singing worship songs and waving their hands in the air, waving them around like they just don't care. And Gabriel smiled and said, oh, those are the Baptists. They think they're the only ones here. Right? And you can do that with any denomination you're from. (laughs) See, Peter's problem was that while he thought Gentiles could be saved, he had a hard time treating them as individuals who, like Peter, were also created in God's image and had every right to be part of the family of God. Peter's no, not any more special than Cornelius. While certain things make Christians Christian, for example, trusting in Christ as, G, uh, as Lord and Savior and loving our neighbor and et cetera, et cetera, see, we cannot have, though, a legalistic, narrow-minded prejudging spirit in us that says, if you're going to be a Christian, then you need to act like us, you need to vote like us, you need to talk like us, you need to look like us, you need to have the same music as us, and etc., etc., etc. That is not what it means to follow Jesus. Rather, that's what it means to join a social club. The church is the family of God, and everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved and will be part of the family of God. See, like David, we need to ask the Lord to purify us, cleanse us, wash us, so that we can be clean of any deep-seated prejudice, racism, legalism, or judging spirit that we have within us. So have you asked the Lord to create a clean heart for you and to give you a renewed, steadfast spirit within you. Go and read Psalm 51. The question we must all reflect on is, who are our neighbors? Who are they? I may have quoted from this passage earlier in our Acts series, but it bears repeating. Wayne Gordon, his book, Who is My Neighbor? Lessons from a Man Left Dead, answers the question this way. My neighbor is someone hurting, who needs help, who cannot help themselves, who appears on my path, who has been robbed, who is half dead, who is naked, who is unable to ask for help of a different race, who is a stranger, who has been stripped, who is a foreign traveler, who is someone who has immigrated from a different country, who has been beaten up, who might require me to take a risk, who can't walk, who looks horrible, who is of a different religion, who is destitute, who is a victim of injustice, who has been passed by, who can't say thank you, who has been wounded, whom nobody wants to help, who is lonely, who will cost me some time, who is visible, who is a victim, 
who has been violated, who has been vulnerable, who is a human being, who feels humiliated, who feels helpless, who is poor, who is someone I'm afraid to help, who is discouraged, who might cost me money, who needs tender loving care, who feels defeated, and who is someone I am able to help. Bottom line, anybody. And see, this is the problem about church. And yet, Sunday is the most segregated day of the week. We've got Anglican, we've got Anglo churches, black churches, Hispanic churches, Asian churches. They all separate and all worship on Sunday, and then they all work together during the week. That's backwards. The book of Revelation tells us that eternal life will be filled with people of every tribe, tongue, and nation. It's not going to be separated like it was in the, in the joke. So if that does not sound appealing to us on earth, how can we possibly expect eternity and the new heavens, new earth, where borders and segregation and social clubs and cliques won't exist? So what's going on in this text? The Lord is telling Peter and telling all of us, we better get ready and we better start being comfortable with people who are different than us, look like us, voted different than we are, come from a different language or different religion, who finally have trust in the Lord. All those people you're going to see in the new heavens and new earth. And you might be surprised by who's there and who is not there. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we are so thankful and so just, we have so much gratitude for who you are and for the wonderful gifts that you've given us and that you can cleanse us from all of our sin, even the ones that sometimes seem to be more socially acceptable. And so God, I pray God this morning that you will cleanse us from any, anyone here or any kind of heart that we may have of racism or prejudice or judging spirit or legalism or anything that's pushing people away or giving us angry when we see them. I pray, God, that you will bring down the barriers that we may be having between two different groups of people. And so, God, we pray, God, that you will bring people together that are part of your family of God and help us to know how to love each other in a way that is respectful of you, in the manner of walking worthy in you. And so I pray, God, for everything you've given us. I pray for our time here. I pray, God, that you equip us and give us a new reinvigorated spirit that's been cleansed by your word to go out and to minister to the people in our in our towns, and our neighbors, even people who we don't like or people that we look different than us. Give us a heart for your kingdom and those who were created in your image, which is everyone. We thank you for everything you've given us. In your name we pray, amen. So one of the ways we can kind of give back to God and show him our gratitude for what he's done for us is to give back some of them, our time, talent, some back of our money back to the Lord. So ask for the ushers to please come forward. Let us pray. Lord, Heavenly Father, thank you for the many blessings you've given us uh, for this beautiful day, this chance to to come together to worship and to learn from your word. Thank you for the message on who is my neighbor and help us to think about that while we're thinking about our neighbors. Uh, Thank you for this opportunity, Lord, for us to give back to you a portion of what you've blessed us with and I ask that uh, each of us, as we can, to do so. Amen.